from memory is a introduction to C to B transition for me. Please tell me if I'm wrong, but that's not the first thing up and that would be great. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Ariana and Susie Perry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let's see what uh, we have for the agenda items. Make sure we're not missing the order. Pull up my chat. Can you, uh, Jen, can you share it or do you want me to share it? I am working on sharing it, but for some reason it wants me to sign back into everything. So it might take me a second. <laughs> I apologize. All right. Would you like us to just get going? Yeah, yeah. sure. And let me move all my stuff around here. Ariana, do you want me to run the slideshow while you uh, present? I have no preference. I have it pulled up, whatever is easier for you. No, go ahead. Okay, awesome. Good morning, everyone. I know many of you um, and nice to see those of you that I don't. I look forward to getting to know you. My name is Ariana Whiting. I'm the early intervention for me, our new name for our early intervention program under the DOE, um, Part C State Coordinator. So let me um, try to get my PowerPoint here. So Susie and I put together a very brief introduction to the transition from early intervention and potentially into early childhood special education for you all. So our hope today is to um, really have a balcony level overview of the transition from early intervention and potentially into early childhood special education for eligible children when they turn three. We will cover um, IDEA's requirements for smooth transitions and the policies that guide that, um, including early intervention for me notifying SAUs of upcoming children that might be eligible for early childhood special education and um, kind of what the different roles are in the transition conference, which we'll go over, and then the subsequent um, activities that take place after the transition conference. So IDEA requires that every state has a um, robust policy to ensure that children that are graduating from early intervention enter early childhood special education smoothly if they're eligible. And um, as all of you know, I'm sure, this has typically been handled in-house in CDS. And so this is brand new for us to be collaborating with school districts. So we wanna make sure that our students, I suppose we'll call them when they turn three, are transitioning um, smoothly out of early intervention and into your programs. So um, we're hoping that this graphic will serve a foundation for our conversation today, but also will be a resource that you can use moving forward. Um, beginning with our planning and early intervention with the family. And here we really followed the federally required timelines, but we begin this planning process as soon as a child enters early intervention, because we know at this time that the child will be exiting early intervention um, by their third birthday at the very latest. And so we wanna make sure that families are prepared for what might come next. And that might be early childhood special education if they're eligible. And so we'll go over these steps more in depth, but really we start with our planning and early intervention. And then we let you know of upcoming children that will be turning three. Then we hold a transition conference, which is a part C led meeting that really talks about what the next steps are for the family in a formal way. And then from there, we pass the baton to part B 619 where an initial eligibility evaluation will be done if additional evaluative information is needed. And then an IEP will be held and an IEP developed and implemented by the third birthday. So our federal um, requirement is that a child transitioning from early intervention has an IEP written and ready to implement on their third birthday. 
if a child is turning three over the summer, writing that IEP by the third birthday meets this requirement as long as it's ready to implement by the time the child turns three. I mean, excuse me, by the time the school year begins after the child turns three. And so the notification requirement is um, that early intervention for me lets you know of the children that are turning three at least 90 days before their third birthday. And we do that with um, parental consent because there really is this confidentiality barrier between early intervention and early childhood special education. Even though we're all under um, the Department of Education, we wanna make sure that families know that their information is going to be shared with schools and they do have the opportunity to opt out of that if they don't want to move forward with eligibility for early childhood special education. So the requirement is that that notification happens at least 90 days before the third birthday, but we like to do it a little bit earlier because we're also required to have that transition conference at least 90 days before the third birthday. So in order to um, ensure that smooth transition and allow for adequate planning, we may do that as early as two years and three months for kids that we know might need um, more evaluation information, but typically between about two years and six months um, and two years and nine months at the absolute latest. And I did want to clarify that we're really talking about kids that are already in early intervention. And I think down the road, we'll get into those more nuanced situations for kids that are referred to early intervention late because things change just a bit in that situation. So Susie may want to add a little bit here, but we wanted to make sure that um, schools know that this notification is to be treated as an initial referral um, through IDEA. And so that means that once we obtain consent from the family to move forward with this process, the school um, informs the family of their rights through the procedural safeguards. And then the responsibility is theirs to move forward with the intake process for a new referral. Susie, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think you pretty much covered it. Um, okay. I, I think, yeah. Well, we're going to be going into more in-depth presentations um, for your school teams after this. This is a pretty high level, so uh, I think you covered it there. Awesome. Thank you. And so after we notify of the children that are upcoming, we convene a transition conference. And so early intervention for me, the service coordinator would be the person that would schedule this meeting. And they would provide the prior written notice to the family with enough time for them to plan to attend and ensure that the family representatives from early intervention for me and the SAU are all present in this meeting. And the goal, again, is to really formally go over what the transition looks like and specifically what early childhood special education services might look like in your specific district. So again, it is absolutely required that this occurs before the child is two years and nine months old or 90 days, three months before their third birthday. And as I mentioned, um, we have requirements to inform the family that this is upcoming, and then we do the written notice after this meeting. And as Susie mentioned, we will get into more details about um, prior written notice and written notices um, and those responsibilities in future meetings. So after the transition conference, the baton is passed to the district and they start to, um, oops, get parental consent for evaluation, refer for those evaluations, and make sure that those are completed within the 60-day timeline, which is the Part B requirement. And so um, to do, or really to gather the information needed to establish eligibility, the school could use um, any Part C evaluations that might be relevant and determine what additional information might be needed. And then, of course, obtain parental consent to complete those evaluations and make those referrals. And so there are a couple of timelines happening all at once here. And that graphic that I showed when we first started lays those out. Um, but we want to make sure that we're meeting the 60 day timeline for evaluations, but also the timeline to have the IEP written and implemented by the third birthday. And so that really logically is why 
the transition conference must occur at least three months before the third birthday to allow time for all of that to happen before the child turns three. And so um, the IEP meeting to determine eligibility um, must be conducted within 30 calendar days of the eligibility determination. And then um, as soon as possible, following that meeting, the IEP must be implemented. We mentioned um, summer birthdays very briefly. And Susie, do you want to speak to this a little bit? Um, sure. Uh, you know, this is a challenge for many school districts across the country because typically there are fewer staff at that time, but um, OSEP and the IDEA regulations are that um, the child is determined eligible by the time they turn three. So if they have a birthday during the summer, um, we want to try to anticipate that so that we can get it done before the school teams leave for the year. So prior to the end of the school year, and that way we can make sure that the, the child is in by three. And um, but that is the responsibility uh, of all of the um, people that are working to ensure that children with disabilities have access to high quality and timely uh, educational opportunities. And so, um, you know, this is something that we are working to collaborate with schools and collaborate with Part C, because all of this really requires all of us to work together and coordinate and collaborate to make sure that we have these done on time. We haven't talked really about the, the um, timeliness factor, but it is a 100% compliance indicator meaning that 100% of our children, the expectation is that 100% of our children have an I, who are in early intervention and are transitioning over have an IEP by the time they're three. So we have some um, ideas for um, best practices to make sure that, that this happens that we'll be sharing at the subsequent presentations. Thank you, Susie. And just to piggyback on that, we have that 100% expectation that our transition conferences are held by two years at nine months. And so we will do our best to plan for those children in advance while the school year is still underway. But there will certainly be scenarios where we will need to connect with someone to have a transition conference over the summer. So we just wanted to kind of start to plan for that. And so I'm um, just really briefly thinking about the data that we will need to collect at the state level for the children that are being served by um, the schools in cohort one. Um, I think that this will be evolving and will require some collaborative conversation, um, but we certainly want to continue to track referral data um, for children that are referred um, both to early intervention for me and um, to the schools. And then Susie and I have, we're both spreadsheet people. I'm not sure if everyone in this group is as well, but we have um, really started to develop some tools so that we can have a unified and comprehensive system to track data um, that's happening kind of outside of our statewide data system, including referrals, eligibility, and IEP dates. And then of course, um, reasons why we may miss that timeline. There are some allowable exceptions. Um, and then there are, of course, things that happen. Um, and we want to make sure we know exactly why we may have missed that timeline if that happens. Susie? Sure. Um, I put in here that school districts will develop a method because we don't want to tell you how to do it. But certainly, we're prepared to provide you with a tracking method and a system that will help you should you want to adopt it. And um, it's one that's you know been used by lots of other states, and so um, hopefully it'll be helpful to you to have that. We'll provide that to you as well. Perfect. And perhaps Susie, we could offer ourselves to meet with folks if they wanted to have any assistance or guidance in developing a tool. Sure. And so you just touched on the data tracking sheets. Um, would you like to say anything about next steps before we move into questions? Um, 
No, I just think that, you know, we, we understand that tracking this from the beginning of your school year when the kind of the responsibility is turned over to school districts. So we are intent on providing you with um, professional development to help your school teams to understand what the responsibilities are. So um, we, you know, we're planning on, on creating that, rec making recordings so that, you know, people can watch it whenever they want, or we could present it live to you. We, you know, haven't quite figured out what would be best for you, but um, are certainly open to uh, suggestions for how that would be helpful to you to help your school teams to know what these responsibilities, the, you know, the people who would be responsible. Thank you. And I'm happy to go back to that graphic if it would help guide any potential questions or if people have anything off the top of their head, we are here to help. One thing I want to point out is that this is gonna be um, new information. It was new information for me when I stepped into this role. You do not have the authority to view or understand any of this information unless the parents give you express um, permission to, to share this information with the SAU. It could be that the parent elects not to do that and elects not to um, pursue an identification in special education. There is a barrier between Part C and Part B that's not doesn't exist in Part B. So in schools, we're used to being able to access certain information. For instance, if a child transitions from one school to the next, we know that we can access those records without parental permission. There is a difference even in um, CDS Part B staff can't have access to Part C data unless they are given permission expressly by the parent. So that's kind of a new, it's a new kind of thinking in terms of schools and how we're used to accessing and sharing this information. So I just wanted to point that out because there could be potentially, we may have highlighted for you, you have five three-year-olds and then only three of them have a transition conference and you may be wondering what's happening there. And that could be that the, par the parents aren't interested in pursuing a special education referral, so. And just as a point of clarification for the SAU, if the parent opts to not pursue a special education uh, referral, then that is not a child for which you have a FAPE obligation. That is true. And um, there was a question in the chat about sharing the graphic and I think that there was just one little thing I needed to fix on it that we found at the last minute. And so this, I'll, can we put that graphic and the PowerPoint into the email that goes out, the follow-up that goes out after these meetings? Yes, absolutely. Okay, next on the agenda, the MOU, I'm handing it to Megan and Sandy. All right, MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding. <laughs> Not, I can't imagine anything more exciting. Big fun here. Um, so it would be helpful if um, we could uh, present that. I can do that here, but I'm on a single screen. So if uh, any of my colleagues have it up on their screen and want to share that, great. Otherwise, just tell me I have to do it and I will manage to, uh, to do the Zoom share thing. Sandy or Jen, can you share it? Yeah, Sandy's gonna share it. I'm gonna try, how about that? <laughs> Let's see. Sandy, I've got it right up if you want me to share it. I just was trying to avoid not being able to see all the humans. There you go, just make it a little bit bigger so we don't see all your notes. <laughs> I, I know, that's what I'm trying to do is try to get it outside of the when I used to present at my school board, I had um, I had a Mac. And so you know how bad a desktop can get after, you know, a half a week. <laughs> and so before every school board meeting, I would create a folder called um, HMS, which uh, then I would take all of my documents that were sitting on my um, desktop and drop it into HMS. HMS stood for hide my shame. Um, and it got bad enough that I had to actually put dates on those folders, HMS date one, two, 
because there was a lot of shame. <laughs> it just kept getting more cluttered. All right. So thank you, Sandy. I can see that. Um, Sandy, if you can make it just a little bit bigger so old folks yeah. like me can actually read it and then scroll up to the top and I'll walk folks through it. Um, once again, this is the memorandum of understanding that um, is set out for um, sort of articulating uh, an agreement between the Department of Education, your SAU, and and CDS, um, and the CDS site with whom you're working. Um, this is using this this framework or format that you see here is using the State of Maine uh, MOU template, um, and is one that uh, so it, it has these sections that are sort of already articulated and outlined. So the purpose section is exactly what I just outlined. Um, the introduction and background draws in language uh, from the law, public law that was passed. Um, so, Sandy, if you can keep scrolling down, um, the main thing to know about a lot of the information that you're going to see in here is it is really drawn largely from what is the language in statute. Um, it, so it is it does have a lot of legalese and does point to a number of areas uh, in statute. So when we get to the se section on parties, this is the, the three parties, the main department of education, CDS and um, SAUs. It may be that you decide that you don't want to, and if you could scroll back up to just the, S, the CDS section for a second, mm -hmm. the CDS section, you, your, your SAU may say, you know, we're going to have very limited uh, work with CDS. You know, we'll certainly be getting some information from them. And other, the language here is is defines what CDS is in statute, and so it does sound like they still own the FAPE obligation or mm -hmm. anything like. That's just because of the way that they are they're described in statute. So we can scroll down to section four, um, which is the data sharing and legal authority <clears throat> is with any MOU, we need to stipulate where the legal authority for these agreements come from. And in this case, it comes from um, largely federal uh, statute or IDEA. Um, and uh, so that's really what we are referring to here when we're talking about uh, data sharing authority. Section five is the, the work that Sandy and Jen are doing directly with each of you. Um, for the most part, the roles of the Department of Education will be pretty set and will not change too terribly much between um, one MOU and another MOU. The, the, the pieces that will be a little bit different between each of the um, SO, SAUs will be in sections B and C in terms of what do you want from CDS and and what are, what are the needs that are going to be filled between the two? Um, Sandy, do you have anything else to add in terms of the roles and responsibilities? Uh, no, I think the only thing I would add is that we have provided a, a list of ideas that we've come up with. We've met, I think, with everyone at this point. <clears throat> uh, most of the SAUs have an idea of what they are wanting to collaborate with CDS four in the upcoming year. I think one of the things that is um, detailed in this is that we are required to meet monthly to review this MOU, which I did question because, you know, monthly meetings are <clears throat> a lot to put on everybody's table, but this could be a very quick check-in. Things are going good. Things are not, or, you know, we need support with this or this is not working. And this is where we can revise the MOU to add or delete things from that original list. So that's what this is really intended to do is to be a living document that we are updating as you need support or you don't need support anymore. Thanks. So again, much of what you're going to see here, you might raise an eyebrow for, as Sandy said, we both did in terms of especially those those monthly meetings. We we're like, for real? Um, but that is what is outlined in the statute. So Tammy, I see your hand up. I just want to give a bit of encouragement because um, as the director at CDS Reach, I do do a lot of monthly meetings with my school districts and we head off a lot of problems Right. We end up saving ourselves time and we come to an understanding. And sometimes the meetings are a half an hour to an hour, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. So I just want to say encouragement because I do think it will save issues down the road. Thank you. Thanks for that, Tammy. Yep. So I want to just re review the compensatory services section for a moment. So if we could scroll up a smidge there. Um, this is one that we want to get really clear on. So the statute states that CDS, prior to the full um, assumption of the FAPE obligation, assumed by the SAU, that CDS, the site, will review each of the cases of the students who will be shifting 
to that SAU to identify um, the extent to which um, that child may or may not may be eligible for compensatory services. Um, and it also stipulates that CDS will actually set up and administer the IEP team meeting. Um, I, we do want to say the, the purpose of the first paragraph in that section is really to outline the fact that we recognize that we need to follow the statute and an SAU may say, gosh, you know what? We want to be the ones who are setting up those IEP team meetings. We're building those relationships with, with those families. We know that CDS still owns the compensatory services responsibility, but we're the ones that want to set up the meeting. So that's why that paragraph is in there. It's still saying, notwithstanding anything else, we're still going to follow this subsection. We know that it is the responsibility of CDS to set it up, but we're going to try to build in some flexibilities to allow for that to happen. So we, we've tried to, to write that in a way that allows for the maximum flexibility while also following the law in that very helpful manner. So if we can scroll down again, it is all about determining um, whether or not special education related services have have not been provided um, completely or partially, and then whether or not there is uh, compensatory services that are warranted. Um, so that, that piece just spells out what will happen. The other part is that in the last paragraph, we really tried to be um, as clear as possible about before the SAU assumes the FAPE obligation, that review should happen, but the compensatory ed IEP team meetings are gonna be held within the first 60 calendar days of the transfer of the FAPE obligation. Again, it's crucial that we get these compensatory services in place. Um, that's really vital. And we also recognize that we wanted to make sure that, that happened in a reasonable time that was consistent with other regulations outlined. Um, Sandy or Aaron, anything you want to add about comp comp ed? Nope. No, just to reiterate that that's not the uh, fiscal responsibility of the SAU. Yes. And if, if um, SAUs do not have an understanding of that at this time, we will ensure that they know what that is upon that transfer. Thanks. Um, section seven, I'm gonna just breeze through really quickly because that was the crux of what we spent most of our time on last week. Um, and in the follow-up email that was sent following our um, meeting that had the agenda and other attachments, that language is the exact same language that we dropped into that, that doc document. So I'm going to kind of move through that pretty quickly for the sake of time. Um, keep on rolling. Keep on Student rolling. council. Probably, yeah. So um, section eight is the term uh, the MOU is effective on, and that's going to be rep representative of what the date uh, the, of the that the FAPE obligation is being assumed by your SAU. So that changes. The places where you see red are the places where we are expecting there to be um, some changes. <clears throat> um, and this MOU is in effect for a year. Um, part of the reason for those monthly meetings is to identify amendments or changes that may need to happen and um, and you know have them in place for the next MOU. But these MOUs will be just one year in, in length and then we'll, we'll create a new one. Um, section nine, the review and amendment, as we've already touched on, um, that the MOU will be uh, reviewed regularly. Um, the entirety, again, this is language that is uh, entirety, severability. Um, those are all uh, just legal language that we have to include in there for anything that's a state of Maine MOU. And last but not least, the signatures of the people. Um, so it will be signed by, um, right now it says it's gonna be the commissioner, it's likely going to be the uh, deputy uh, commissioner. So um, that is a quick, Overview of the MOUs, again, the parts that are going to be most meaningful for each individual SAU will be um, the section uh, section five, which is sort of what the actual services are. Um, what, if any, questions do folks have? Okay. Yep. I will hand setting up those meetings with SAUs shortly, very soon. Thank you very much. Next. All right, next, um, we're gonna go through a document that we're gonna be sharing with you. It's a decision-making document, which is um, memorialized decisions that we've made and when we've made them so that you guys, um, 
well that so everybody can kind of have really clear information right because one of the things that happens is we may discuss something for instance the two star rating for the um child care centers and then people have you know a mixed understanding of what that is so this is going to be a an evolving document and we may at some point change some decisions that we've made already because as you know this is all kind of a work in progress um but um the fiscal decisions that have been made um are that um, all children coming from outside the sau are included from that doesn't make sense to me actually <laughs> does anyone from the fiscal team uh can interpret that? All right, we're gonna skip that one. We're gonna reword it before we give it to you. Um, upon signing with cost associated with child fine, we have upon signing permission to evaluate. We gave you that chart at the last time. You're going to receive $1,000 per child for children who are in child fine. And again, that is at the quarter reporting period when you have um, a signed consent to evaluate, you get an additional $1,000 for that child in the referral process. Seed is going to be paid by the DOE. There is no seed component here. If you are billing main care, um, the money is going to be returned in the form of detracting from any future payments. Because again, you can't get payment twice for the same service. Um, and for those of you who are billing main care and want to continue to do that and work your way down, knowing that at some point this it's all going to be fleshed out. Uh, we have directions on how to set yourself up as a service location in order to do that. Um, this today, today, uh, August 7th, you are going to get a letter. Actually, it says August 8th, but I think this afternoon you're going to get a letter that delineates the funding that you'll be receiving based on what we understand of is the amount of children in your catchment area in this age group. So uh, you will have one week to review that letter and then determine whether or not that you have any questions or concerns or if you feel like the calculation uh, if you have any questions about that calculation, you can um, let us know as soon as possible. We'll have an individual meeting with you. Once those, once that timeline has been passed, we will be issuing those monies at the end of next week or early uh, the week after. So it's either going to be by Friday of next week or Monday of the week after, which I think is the 19th. Um, the child care, uh, the child's first location is their least restrictive environment, meaning if wherever that child is, when they're in the child find process, um, that is considered their LRE. And that would be a basis for conversation of any IEP meeting. If they can grab their services in that LRE, then that would be the one that you would want to continue. Child care settings that have at least a two-star quality rating may be identified as the LRE for children three to under school age six. You know, we use that term sometimes. So if the child care is under a two-star quality rating, they um, will likely not be able to be identified as the LRE for those children. I have here links to looking up the child care rating. That's a place where you can enter in your zip code and look up the places in your areas and what their ratings are. Then I have the main Rising Stars general information page that has all kinds of qualifying information on it. And then there is a list of eligible providers for the 23, 24, um, hasn't been updated yet, but that is um, a list of all the providers. Yes, Sandy. I was just going to add that we have a list for each SAU. So if we haven't shared that, we will also do that. So okay. you have a list of each SAU, what children that you have attached to that SAU, 
that are in child care is in or out just outside of their area, correct? No, we have the list of the child cares. Oh, okay. Yeah. A broad list of the child cares in Maine, child care centers in Maine. Okay. Um, when we are sending the child find spreadsheets, they're going to be encrypted so that we're protecting the PII. And then um, the student counts and fiscal responsibility um, numbers one and two from the funding document and MOU would be the student counts. So we will be sending this PII, yes, sorry, personally identifiable information. These are the um, actions that have been agreed to upon to date. And we will be, like I said, sending you this sheet and then it would, when it's updated or if it's updated or when we make more decisions, you can see that there are some um, highlighted yellow places, which are where we have um, identified still a need to collect some information, such as child care settings outside your catchment area, programming, um, determinations and also data. We are working on a data spreadsheet, which is kind of, uh, Susie's working on that in terms of how and what kind of data will be collected. We anticipate that that's going to be something that we can share pretty soon. So those are just our way of kind of, like I said, making sure everyone's clear on um, what decisions have been made, when they've been made, and then if they change, we'll um, put a different, we will add that. Um, just so that you are all aware, this is a um, kind of an internal document. This is one that we use among our team. Everything that we're still sharing out with you, we're still trying to make sure that um, you get the current version. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the information that we've shared, um, the decisions that are clear and we think are clear enough to be understood and yeah. we'll put them into the notes so that you're not managing multiple, multiple uh, different attachments, which seems to yeah, be our be primary way of, of attaching things. So, or of sharing information. So that's how this information, it will not look exactly like this because this is our internal doc. All right, um, and last on the agenda are main care enrollments. So um, I alluded to this earlier, if you are, and many, some of you have approached us and said, listen, I'm ready to do main care billing. It's, it's all up to date. We have a instructional um, notice on how to change a, or set up a new service location. That's going to be a priority if you're doing main care billing. Setting up a new service location will enable us to keep track of the amount of money you're getting for services and make sure that you're not paying seed on services for children in that age range. So again, if you have inquired about that, we have likely sent you the paragraph explanation on how to set up a service location. I do understand that it takes about 30 to 45 days to do that. And so if you are planning on billing main care, you probably want to address that or apply for a service location as soon as possible. Um, and again, main care is not a requirement at this time uh, for any of you at this point. So just understand that as well. And I think that is it. So if there are further questions, we can go ahead and address them now. You do have communication, Sandy, we have communication coming from, um, yep. that is gonna be made available to you, I think by the end of the week, is that true, Sandy? Um, we're hoping to get it to folks today with the information from this meeting. So we've been talking about um, kind of template letters that SAUs in cohort one can use to inform different constituents. So it could be, um, 
a letter to referral sources in your community, doctor's offices, um, other agencies that would normally refer to CDS. <clears throat> and this is, of course, depending on um, each SAU is could be doing something a little differently in regards to referrals. But if you're taking that over, um, there's a template letter for that. There's a template letter for related service providers. If you're interested in contracting with them or knowing that you are now the, um, the SAU that's going to be taking over services and there's a template letter in there for parents as well. So we will send that. And I um, have put them in a Google folder so that you can easily transition them over to your um, system. Additionally, site directors will be giving you some detailed information tomorrow of how you are going to be communicating simultaneously. So, and connecting with parents on the CDS end to help under help uh, our parents understand this transition and just reassure folks that we um, are still very much um, working to support these children. All right, I think that is it, unless there's any questions. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your week and we will see you next week, 10 a.m. See ya.